Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining me today. It's Alan Berry Labucan with the Rocks and Stocks News Show, and I've got a very special guest in Peter Schiff. Uh, Peter is uh, one of the most vocal and long-term gold bulls that you can find. I love that he is uh, what we call in hockey a drop-the-gloves kind of guy. Um, he gets uh, the Bitcoin folks all worked up and the Wall Street types and even got himself kicked off of CNBC because uh, they don't want to hear about gold too much. Peter, I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Been a big fan of your work. Thank you very much for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me on. So um, why don't we uh, why don't we start with gold? Um, you know, I see a lot of this uh, this nonsense from the Bitcoin crowd trying to uh, pull money away from gold and gold stocks. And, you know, they're really trying to promote a Ponzi scheme as far as I'm concerned. And uh, gold is the safe, uh, the, the soundest money. And uh, I, I think that they they're riding on your coattails a lot. Yeah, well, that's the whole uh, story for of Bitcoin. They're they're basically trying to pass it off as an alternative uh, and superior form of gold. They call it digital gold, uh, but it's not digital gold at all, right? Any more than a an image of a hamburger is digital food. Uh, you know, you you can't eat digital food if that's your diet. You're going to starve. You know, there there are some things that you know, lend themselves to digital. I can read a digital book. I can listen to digital music, uh, but I can't do anything with digital gold. <laughs> uh, and, and, and it's not a store of value. It's not a, you know, a monetary asset. Uh, all it is is a string of numbers that has been tokenized and you can own it. And the only thing you can do with it is you could trade it. So I can sell it. I can give it to somebody. But the person who I give it to you know, he has the same choices. He could give it to somebody else or he could trade it. Uh, but there's no underlying demand for the token because there's no real use for it. Um, but they're trying to market it as gold. That's why Bitcoin is is represented as a coin, even though it's not a coin. And, and they make it the color gold to make it look like a gold coin. It's really like a counterfeit. Uh, but it's fool's gold. People have made a lot of money in it, of course, because the greater fools have been willing to pay a higher price. So the people that got in many, many years ago um, and who are cashing out and who have already cashed out made a lot of money. But the people who have bought it over the last two, three years haven't really made any money because the price has gone sideways. Bitcoin is no higher today at 63,000 than it was almost three years ago. It was November in 2021 where Bitcoin hit 69,000. But during those three years, that's when most people who own Bitcoin bought theirs. So they're not making any money. Meanwhile, they could have bought gold. Bitcoin is down over 30% in terms of gold over the past three years. And, and this is despite all the institutional efforts, the, ma the mass marketing campaigns, Super Bowl commercials, NFTs, you know, Wall Street, uh, pump and dump, all this stuff that's been going on to hype people, El Salvador, MicroStrategy, huge conferences. They just had 20,000 plus people in, uh, uh, in, in Nashville. And they got that Michael Saylor coming in there and he's borrowing money. Billions. To buy a Ponzi scheme. Yeah, he's going, he keeps borrowing more and more money to buy Bitcoin, to prop up the price of what he already owns. So, yeah, it's, you know, it, it, eventually this thing is going to implode. I mean, any day you just don't, you know, it's but but Walt, they're trying to keep it propped up. Now, Wall Street is in on the action because they're making fees on these Bitcoin ETFs. But the investors are not making any money and they're not really investors or they're gamblers. Uh, and they don't yeah, and they keep pointing back to, you know, they, how, they how much big, they think they're investors. Well, they're wrong. <laughs> You know, they, they bought into a bill of goods. But, yeah, I mean, people made a lot of money who correctly anticipated how, you know, popular this, you know, would become. But the people who 
are buying now and who have been buying these last few years, they are the proverbial bag holders. They, they're going to get stuck with uh, their Bitcoin when the music stops. And do you think that they have taken some of that speculative money, general investors, away from gold? Yeah, I mean, at the margins, sure. In fact, if you look at the, the introduction of the Bitcoin ETFs in January of this year, that's when you started to see a lot of money come out of gold ETFs and gold stock ETFs. So it's clear that a lot of people who have brokerage accounts decided at the worst possible time to sell their gold and their gold stocks and buy Bitcoin. <laughs> they would have been better off just staying where they were. But uh, those funds are starting to flow the other way now. The finally, yeah. finally a little bit. But you know, yeah. this is the best year gold's had since 1979. 45 years, and the public is not participating at all. No, no. They've been selling. And do you think that, I think that it reminds me a lot of the dot bomb era. And I, I, I and look what happened to gold yeah. after the dot bomb. Um, I think that there's a possibility that as Bitcoin goes down, some of that money maybe has already started, but I think that a massive correction could happen in Bitcoin that uh, rivals the dot bomb era. Yeah. Well, you remember, most of the money that got into Bitcoin can never get out because it just, you know, it, it it's gone, right? You want to sell your Bitcoin. If nobody wants to buy it, you can't get any money out. Uh, the money that's coming out of Bitcoin is the money that's already come out. The people who sold the Bitcoin uh, did something with that money. But now you have people holding on to what really is worthless nothing, tokens. But yeah, I mean, I think when people stop buying Bitcoin, uh, more money will start flowing into gold. You know, the people who are stuck with the Bitcoin, they're out of luck, right? They, they're, they're, they're holding an empty bag. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I do think that. But, you know, most of the demand for gold is coming from outside the United States. And a lot of it is coming from foreign central banks. They've been buying all year as Americans have been selling. They don't buy and, Bitcoin. And so that's going to continue. They don't buy Bitcoin. No, they're not that foolish. Before we get into gold a little bit more, I did think that I do think that there is a catalyst that could start a major correction in Bitcoin, which is that. Um, you know, you look at the ETF action, which is kind of the last of the prop jobs for the bag holders. And though the average buyer over the since the ETFs came out or in anticipation is probably somewhere around 65,000 per Bitcoin. And as it gets down, people are going to start sweating. And I, I think that it could drop significantly below the cost of mining the Bitcoin, and these these could be massive catalysts for a big correction. What do you think about now, that? You know, the, the, the ETFs are going to end up being the worst thing to happen to Bitcoin. You know, you live by the, the sword, you die by it, and that applies to the ETF. Uh, I think that at some point, Bitcoin is going to fall low enough. And, you know, where that point is, it's hard to say whether it's, uh, you know, 40,000, 30,000, 20,000. But at some point, the ETF speculators are going to throw in the towel, right? These guys are not your die in the wool, uh, Bitcoin maxis, fundamental true believers, hodl till the grave type people, right? They're traders, they're investors. They kind of got in on it because they, 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 they got in on the hype and they, they thought it would go to the moon and they took a shot right with these ETFs. When it doesn't work out, they will cut and run at some point. They'll lick their wounds and they'll, they'll, they'll take what's left and, and, and redeploy it or at least try to. So what's going to happen is all of a sudden you're going to get mass liquidations of these ETFs. But the spot market won't be able to absorb the selling. So there won't just... be buyers. And, and, and when, when people in their Schwab accounts or their Fidelity accounts, when they just click sell my you know, Bitcoin ETF, the Bitcoin ETF then has to go into the market and sell Bitcoin right then. I mean, it can't be queued. It can't have a limit. And it's got to be filled. Um, and, and so these are all of a sudden you get all these market orders to sell 
in a really a vacuum. There's no buyers. The price just collapses. Just like the dot bombs. I mean, I, I don't know where the real buying would come from to allow the ETF buyers to get out. Because the only reason the ETF buyers got in was because you had the large holders that took advantage of the ETF buying to dump their, 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 their tokens. So, and that was happening over a period of months and months and months. You had the small guys getting in and the big guys getting out, but now you have all these small investors loaded up in ETFs. They want to get out in mass because the market is crashing and there's no buyers. And I, I just think it's going to be a, a, a massive collapse in, in, in Bitcoin. Well, I, you're certainly doing the job to warn them. And I hope some of them are listening and starting to get into gold. So now let's really talk about gold. You know, what do you think are the biggest drivers to gold? My feeling is that this is all about debt. I think the U.S. is in a death spiral of debt that, you know, once a death spiral stops, it doesn't or starts, it doesn't stop. And even the world is in a death spiral of debt. You got $318 trillion in global debt. Um, yep. I think this is all about a debt and uh, against gold kind of thing that's going to cause us to go back to a real debt. Yeah, well, look, you know, when you have this much debt, there's two options, default or inflate. And either one is good for gold. Inflate is even better. Uh, but if there's a risk that the U.S. Treasury is going to default, then you don't want to own treasuries. If there's a risk that the U.S. government is going to inflate, then you don't want to own treasuries. So people want to get out. They want to get out of dollars. They want to get out of treasuries. And they're moving into gold um, because gold is the only safe haven from fiat currencies. I mean, that, that, that's where you want to be. And that's what's going on. Uh, and the debt problem is exploding uh, interest on the national debt in the U.S. is over a trillion a year. That's more than we spend on defense. Within a couple of years, we'll be spending more on interest than we do on Social Security or Medicare. And those programs, you know, are, are going up in price. Uh, the national debt is growing by three to four trillion a year right now. Uh, that pace is going to accelerate when we officially enter a recession. Uh, so during the, you know, the the a Harris administration or a next Trump administration, we could be looking at four to five trillion dollar deficits per year. Um, they're, they're, these are completely uh, unfinanceable. The debt is unpayable. Uh, the markets know this uh, or they're starting to know this and they're voting with their feet. They're getting out of dollars. And, you know, there's also a political incentive to get out of dollars now that, you know, we showed the world how we can sanction Russia if we don't like what you do. Uh, nobody really wants to be in that vulnerable position with dollars. So there's a political reason to get rid of dollars. There's an economic reason to get out of dollars. And so that's what's happening. And that's why the dollar index is slowly uh, falling. It's down about 12% from its peak in 2022. It's about 7% above an all-time record low against the Swiss franc. Uh, that's the currency that it's been the weakest against. But it's you know slowly weakening against pretty much all the currencies. Absolutely. I think that's going to accelerate in 2025, which is why the price of gold is going to be moving up even bigger uh, next year than this year. Actually, if you look at the recent action prior to the Fed's move to cut rates by a half a percent, it was already making lower lows and lower highs in a, in a pretty steep correction. It's been propped up in the last week or so, but I think it's it's got a Gretzky in it next, and then it's got a big drop down because ultimately, I think the Fed is going to go back to the free money era. Well, they're going to go back to QE, I believe, by Q1 of next year, because what's already happening is long term interest rates are moving up now that the Fed started cutting. And I think that's going to continue. And I think the yield on the 10 year is going to move back above 4% before the end of this year. And that's going to prompt the Fed back into QE because the Fed's going to want to lower those long-term rates. And the only way it can do that is by going into the bond market and buying up the bonds to push up the price. And it has to go back to QE to do that. If it so it's going, to, it's going to have to create more inflation. 
it wants they want to cut rates, but if they, they have to go into the market to justify their rate cuts to get more in line with the Federal Reserve interest rate policy. Well, I mean, they want to cut rates, but the market won't let them without the QE. So they got to get in there. Because the yield curve is going to normalize and the, the rate cuts are inflationary and the bond markets will price that in. Uh, so the, the only way the Fed can really bring down long term rates is to do quantitative easing. But that means creating much more inflation. And so oh, now we're going to start to hear, see uh, the CPI take off. Didn't you hear the guy from the Fed yesterday? He says, oh, no, we're going to keep lowering our balance sheet. I know, but they're 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 just saying that they're going to they're, they're not going to do that, because if they keep doing that, long term <clears throat> interest rates are going to keep rising. Exactly. And, and they want they want them to come down, especially when the unemployment rate really starts to move up. It's already high uh, because they don't report it properly. But if you even if you look at the government's own U, U6 number, that's at 7.9 percent. That's a high rate. And, and the real rate is higher than that. But the 4.2 percent that they that they use uh, to, for the public is completely meaningless because there's so many unemployed people that are that are no longer counted in that number that is completely worthless as, even, a, as an actual measure of unemployment. Even they're admitting that, Peter. In the last one, uh, he got some, Powell got some questions about the uh, revisions to the BLS, BLS numbers and called it artificial. The, the yeah, All the numbers are artificial. Are artificial. <laughs> the job numbers, the GDP numbers, the inflation numbers. It's all just, you know, worthless information. And that's why it's so ridiculous. The Fed says, well, we're data dependent, yet the, the data that they depend on is, is worthless. You know, what, the, what they should look at is the price of gold. That tells them that they're too loose, that the Fed says, hey, you know, we had a restrictive policy. They never had a restrictive policy. They, nev they never stopped the borrowing or the spending. If the Fed had restrictive policy, the governments would have had to cut spending. Households would have cut back on their spending. Credit card debt would have come down. Household savings would have gone up. Instead, because the Fed maintained a loose monetary policy the entire time, we have record high household debt and record low savings. You look at things in realistic economic terms, and it really boggles my mind that you've got a couple hundred PhD economists at the Fed, and they're getting fooled by artificial BLS numbers. And I'm no economist, Peter, but I saw, I've been reporting for months now about how full-time jobs are in decline, part-time jobs are in increase. So basically people are losing a higher paying full-time job to take on one or two, and they're making less money in the part-time. How can yeah, they and they're losing they're losing their benefits. And, you know, most of the jobs, though, that we've created, the, the part time jobs have gone to people who already had a job, maybe a full time job. And now they have one full time job and one part time job. We're not bringing people into the labor force. We're just forcing the people who are already in the labor force to work harder. And why are so many people moonlighting with second and third jobs? It's not because they want to do all this extra work. It's because it's the only way they can pay the bills because their groceries are so expensive. Their rent is so expensive. Their utility bills, their insurance, everything costs so much that you can't pay the bills with one job anymore. And so you need two or three jobs. Yet now the government takes credit for all this job creation when these are jobs that people don't want. And the Fed, <laughs> the Fed too. Yes, everybody is happy that people are working two or three jobs except the people who have those jobs, they would rather not have them. They want one good job. They don't want two or three lousy jobs. And there's more evidence in that BLS revisions. If you look at the components, the biggest revisions were in the best paying jobs. Almost half. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And of course, on balance, all the new jobs went to immigrants. That's where the jobs are coming from. People are coming into the country illegally and getting jobs. But, you know, at least they're working. It's better than them coming here not working. Uh, but we're, we're losing jobs from, you know, Americans that were already here. So, Peter, if, if the Fed is justifying their actions based on artificial, highly manipulated numbers, and 
the politicians are promoting the same thing. Is this really about economics or is it about legacy and bullshit? Well, look, for the government, it's all about getting votes and staying in power and just trying to kick the can down the road and delay the, the inevitable. But they've been doing that for so long that it's hard to believe there's much road left to kick the can down. You know, we, we, we're, we're going to have to face reality. And I think, you know, that's what gold is telling us. You know, uh, that's what the breakdown and the dollar is going to be telling us and the bond market. I mean, that, that's the next leg. It's gold is moving first. Uh, but the things that are going to really get hot hammered are the dollar and the bond market. Um, and, and, and then when all three of those things are working, that's, you know, pretty much the end game. And, you know, you talk about kicking the can. That can is full of a lot of IOUs. That can's got to be getting pretty heavy. You're going to hurt your foot kicking that thing. <laughs> yeah. You, look, as I said, you can't kick it anymore. I mean, the numbers are just too big at this point. The debt is just too enormous, and it's growing exponentially. You can see it. Our, our current account deficits, our trade deficits are also blowing out at record highs. Um. And, you know, one of the one benefits we've had is that oil prices have been so cheap. I mean, even though, you know, people, oh, it's $70 a barrel, that's pretty cheap. Oil was 140 in 2008. And in fact, if you look at <clears throat> oil and gold, this is the cheapest oil has ever been. Uh, and so that's not going to last much longer. We're going to see a big increase in oil prices. You know, people want to say, oh, oil prices are the reason we have inflation. <laughs> they're, they're the one thing that, 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 that we're getting a deal on. Everything else has gone up, but oil. That deal is in U.S. dollars. The U.S. dollar gets hammered, and that deal goes. Yeah. Up. You know, sometimes I wonder, Peter, if I, I just don't understand how people can't get this. The what, what's happening with the death debt? It is a death spiral of debt. You know, right now it's at 35.1 or two. By the end, I believe the CBO is predicting that the that the debt will be fifty trillion within ten years. It's not. Yeah, gonna... it'll be higher. It it won't take ten years. It, you know, it, I mean, they're always overly optimistic, and the, the, you know what's so ridiculous is we're in the middle of a presidential campaign, and both candidates are promising lots of tax cuts, and um, Harris is promising more government spending. Well, we're already broke. How, how, how can we have these tax cuts? How, I think Harris says, I'm going to give you $25,000 to buy a house, $50,000 to start a business, $7,000 to have a kid. Where's that money coming from? We're broke. Boring. And everybody, Trump is like, no tax on tips, no tax on Social Security, uh, no tax on overtime, cut your taxes, restore the SALT deductions. Okay, but we're broke. The government is running trillion dollar deficits now. How, how, how are we going to get all these tax cuts uh, when we actually need massive tax increases unless we're going to have huge spending cuts? But of course, all this talk about cutting your taxes is all a lie because if they don't cut the spending, they don't cut the taxes because the real never. tax burden is the spending They'll and never. all the spending has to be paid for. And if it's not paid for with the income tax or tariff or payroll tax, it's paid for with the inflation tax. Right? Either the government prints the money or borrows the money, but it has to suck it out of the economy. And either way, it, it, it's more destructive than, than the taxes. So I believe that we're going to see $50 trillion before the end of the next president's term. And, and oh, easy. Go, well, so we're going to... We're going to be by the time Biden finishes his term, it's going to be over thirty-six trillion, right? Uh, maybe even thirty-seven trillion. I mean, Biden is going to set the record for the biggest increase in the deficit in a single presidential term. He's going to beat Donald Trump. He's going to come close to beating Obama because yeah. Obama has the record for the most amount of debt added by a single president, but he had eight years. Yeah. Trump only had four. Biden may do in four years what it took Obama eight years. We'll see. But whoever is president next, whether it's Trump or Harris, is going to break Biden's record. Yes, that's my argument. I think we're going to be looking at three to four trillion. So do the simple math. You don't need to get a calculator, folks. 
36 trillion at three to four, tr let's say three and a half trillion. That gets you to 50 trillion. Yeah, we will get to 50 trillion before the, you know, before, you know, 20, uh, 28. Okay, so let's do some more math for this simplified math. If you have 50 trillion and how low can they really go with interest rates? Yeah, even if they finance it, even if they can finance it at 4%, that's $2 trillion a year in interest on the debt. And now you- Half what they collect in income taxes. That's and, half of income tax. Yeah. Almost. Yeah, look, you know, and, and who knows? It could be even more than that. Well, and, that, and so this requires you to extrapolate out but you have to use evidence to extrapolate out. How hard is the evidence to figure out? You just laid it out. Biden is gonna spend almost as much as the record for two terms in one term. And that's not much more than what Trump did in his one term. So you've got the VP that helped create the record and you got the guy behind him, but the other person, is the guy who is second place for one term spender. Yeah, and look, it, 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 it probably wouldn't have mattered who was in office. It was a foregone conclusion it was going to happen, you know, because this is the trajectory that we're on. You know, it's just going to keep going until it explodes, you know. And so that we're just closer and closer to that to that point. And to me, the numbers are so huge. I can't see how we can get through uh, another four-year cycle without this whole thing imploding. And again, that's what gold is telling you. That's the, the, the warning sign that is being flashed that everybody is ignoring. You know, people want to talk about the Dow. Oh, it's at record high. It's above, you know, 42,000. When this century started uh, in uh, January 1st of uh, 2001, the beginning of the, the new century, the Dow was just over 10,000. And now it's a little over 40,000. So it's gone up four, four, fourfold. Gold was $275. Yeah. It's now 2,600. Gold is up more than twice as much as the Dow during the same period of time. So what does that actually tell you? That in real terms, the Dow Jones has lost almost half its price, half its value. So everything else is just an illusion created by inflation. They want us to think we're richer, but the money is actually just a lot less valuable. So we're trying to, you know, keep score with with money that keeps losing value. It's like so, if you know if they if they if they made a ruler six inches, that doesn't make me twelve feet tall. You know, yeah, I, I I'm just measuring my height with a with a smaller ruler. I'm not any taller than I was, um, and and so you're not richer just because you have more dollars if those dollars uh, have less value. So when I look at the stock market, Wall Street stocks, I see some pretty stretched valuations. But I'm not ready to call for a big correction because I don't think the Fed ever loses sight of their third unspoken uh, mandate, which is to always protect Wall Street. Yeah, I mean, you know, they, well, they're, they're, there's an incestuous relationship there because a lot of the guys that work at the Fed came from Wall Street. And when they leave the Fed, they go back to Wall Street. Right. So it, it's very cozy there. But, um, but sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, so the the whole institution is corrupt, and of course they also work with the government. You know, as much as the Fed wants to claim that they're independent and they're supposed to be, in fact, it's it's not even part of the government. The Fed is private, but they work very closely with the government. Uh, and they, they, they basically facilitate whatever the current administration wants to do, you know, so they make it possible to run big deficits. You know, they, they keep true. interest rates artificially low. They monetize those deficits. They, they make it so politicians don't have to make the difficult political choices that might cost them votes. And they're required to own to do that. That's part of what they have to do is to support the debt. Well, they're not supposed to. That's not their job. In, in fact, when the Federal Reserve was first created, it wasn't even allowed 
to own government bonds. They couldn't even have it on their books. They changed that a few years after the initial act during this, the First World War because they wanted the government, the Fed, to be able to buy these war bonds to help pay for the war. And so they changed the Federal Reserve Act, but they didn't allow the Federal Reserve to buy treasuries directly from the government. They could only go into the market and buy them. They couldn't buy them right from the government. Uh, and, and, and that's the situation today. Uh, so if the Fed wants to buy bonds, it doesn't, you know, it has to call up Goldman Sachs, <laughs> you know, and, and pay them a commission, right? It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't just go direct. But it's unfortunate that they, that they made that amendment because the original purpose of not allowing the Federal Reserve to own any U.S. Treasuries was because they didn't want the Federal Reserve to help the government run debt. And in fact, had the proposal for the original Federal Reserve, had it been included that they could buy treasuries, the act never would have passed Congress and we wouldn't have a Fed today. So they had a, it was like the camel's nose under the tent. They, once they got the Federal Reserve established, then they were able to change it to allow it to do things that it never would have been allowed to do from the beginning because the, you know, the, the, the public and Congress would have been opposed to it. But once they got it started, the Fed gradually got to do more things uh, that the original act never intended it to be able to do. But gradual turned to quite dramatic after the GFC in 2008 <laughs> because they cranked up the, their balance sheet to $9 trillion. Then when they started cut rates, they said, oh, we're going to normalize our balance sheet. So they, but they only were able to get it down to seven trillion. Well, that's now like so. In the global financial <clears throat> crisis, they got it up to four trillion, and then they brought it down to about three trillion. And then we had COVID, and then it ran up to like eight trillion, <laughs> and now they've nine. brought it down to about seven. But you know, it's it, they, they never brought it all the way back down. What what what? Um, ben Bernanke said initially when he first went to Congress to explain the QE program and he was accused of monetizing debt, he said, no, 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 we're not monetizing debt. This is all temporary. We're not going to keep these bonds. We're only buying them temporarily until the emergency is over. And then we're going to sell them and put them right back on the market. And so our balance sheet is going to go right back down to where it started. Now, I said he was lying at the time. But he said it. Congress believed him. Uh, but obviously, I've been vindicated because here we are, you know, whatever it is, uh, 15 years later, and all those bonds are still owned by the Fed and, and more gonna, and way more. And you're going to get more vindicated because what you said earlier about the buyer of last resort, who's going to well, why would anybody when there's so much supply? Why do you want to buy something that has so much supply? They're they're going to crank that thing up to twenty trillion. Oh well, look, look, the balance sheet is going to is going to explode because what's going to happen too is the Fed is going to start buying all sorts of debt because once inflation really rises in a way that it's obvious that the government is cooking the books on the numbers, and the Fed is doing QE and buying treasuries. Everybody's going to be selling their muni bonds, their corporate bonds. And then how is the Federal Reserve going to stop those rates from rising? The Fed's going to have to go buy muni bonds. The Fed's going to have to buy corporate bonds. Great. So, the, And then they're going to have to print up even more money in order to do that. Because if they don't do it, any bonds that the Fed doesn't buy, the rates are going to go way up. And are they going to force all these municipalities into default? No, they'll, they'll bail them out. Uh, and so the Fed doesn't become the buyer of last resort. It becomes the only buyer. Everybody else is a seller. And, 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 and then who knows? I mean, they may start buying stocks, too. Wow. And but uh, then eventually, if the Fed buys everything, then we're just a communist country, right? Because the Fed owns everything. The government will they'll because they can print an unlimited amount of money to buy stuff. I don't know about that. You know, I heard. Ben Bernanke and Greenspan, and they made this argument that the U.S. could never default on the on the debt because they have the printing press of the world reserve currency. But if you start running into problems with the world reserve currency, all that house of cards starts to fall apart. Yeah, I mean, 
once the world knows that you're going to take advantage of your uh, status as the issue of the reserve currency, you lose that status. And then, you know, inflating and defaulting are the same thing, except inflation is worse. But either way, creditors lose. Either they don't get their money or they get money that doesn't have purchasing power. But either way, they, they, they're going to suffer a loss. So it's, it's, it's not a consolation if instead of defaulting, the U.S. government pays you off with worthless money, right? <laughs> but, but that's where we're headed. And anybody who says, oh, we don't have to worry about default because we can print, precisely, we have to worry about printing because it gets you to the same place. In fact, it's even worse. And I've said in my reports that it's a coin flip that heads gold wins, tails gold wins. And my hope is that more people start realizing this especially in the West, the Chinese, the Indians, they buy gold and they hoard it. They don't sell it. And the BRICS nations are doing the same thing. Um, and so I think the only protection for investors, they got to throw away that 60-40 model and uh, start thinking more realistically of what does the world look like in a gold standard? Because Well, it looked great under a gold standard until we abandoned it. Uh, you know, we had the Industrial Revolution under a gold standard. I mean, America thrived uh, and, and we created a standard of living unprecedented in human history under a gold standard. Um, you know, so I think, you know, we'd look a lot better. But, you know, the road back is, is, is very rocky. You know, to get from where we are to where we need to be, it's not easy. That's why we haven't we haven't done it. <laughs> yeah, a lot a lot of people have to lose a lot of money. Uh, unfortunately, because the, the, this, this whole phony economy has to collapse to enable us to, to rebuild a viable one. Uh, but, you know, there are going to be winners, of course, uh, but the losers are, are in control. <laughs> the people who might lose from the toppling of this system. And I so think, they want to perpetuate it. I think it's inevitable. The debt situation, the money printing, they have no backing. It's all a Ponzi scheme. And I think the only thing that investors are going to be protected by is gold and gold stocks. Yeah, well, look, you can own real assets. You know, I think I own a lot of stock in uh, um, foreign companies, uh, both in developed and emerging markets that, you know, produce real goods and provide services that people are going to need and they're going to pay higher prices to get. Uh, so I want to own real, real things. But I also own a lot of gold. I own a lot of gold mining stocks. Uh, I think that the gold mining stocks are going to be some of the biggest percentage gainers uh, in my portfolio. I mean, I think there are stocks that I own that will not just go up five and ten x, but maybe fifty x or or hundred x. Some of the, you know. So the, I, I I think there's going to be a big movement uh, back into gold and mining stocks from institutions, endowments, pension funds, hedge funds. Uh, and this is a very small uh, asset class. You know, there's not a lot of market cap. If you add up all the gold stocks in the entire world that are publicly traded, um, you know, there it, were it's smaller than, than, than a typical S&P 500 company. Less than NVIDIA. Oh, not even close to NVIDIA. I mean, you can't. <laughs> I mean, NVIDIA is a, a world unto itself. Uh, but, you know, nobody owns these stocks right now. And, you know, they're just going to you know, explode. And if even if you look at where the Dow is compared to gold, the Dow is worth about 16 ounces of gold. Uh, historically, that's still uh, on the high side. Uh, it's qu down quite a bit over where it was, you know, the beginning of the, the, the century. It was more like 40 to one, uh, oh, higher, 42 to one, 42 to one. Um, but, you know, in 1980, it was about one to one. <laughs> in in 19. 32 is about one to one. So, you know, even if we got two to one, if the Dow went to 50,000, gold would have to be 25,000. So you got I, much more upside in gold. I made the argument that, and I don't usually make long-term big calls. I've been doing this stuff since 2005, and I rarely look beyond a year or so. But I recently made a call that I think gold goes to 20,000 within 10 years. Yeah, I mean, it could look, gold went from 275 in 2001 to 1900 in 2011. 
Um, and, and so if it made a similar move from where it is now, it would be over 20,000. And, okay, you know, and I, you know, I think it can make a bigger move. The problems are much bigger now than they were back then. Okay. The debt is much bigger. The inflation is much bigger. And the percentages to the GDP, the growth and everything. You know, I, I think that we are so early in this cycle that people just don't get it. Like even gold bulls. They don't get it. And the evidence no. they don't get it is the gold stocks. No, they don't. The gold stocks are priced for lower gold because everybody assumes the price of gold is going to go down in the future. And so that's being priced into the gold mining stocks. Look, the, I have a gold business, Shift Gold. The phones aren't ringing off the hook. You wouldn't even know that gold was at a record high. It's business as usual, which has been pretty slow for the last several years. You know, people are not buying gold. They don't perceive the risk or they're frustrated that gold isn't higher. They would rather buy NVIDIA or they would rather buy Bitcoin. You know, that's where they think the action is. And so they're not paying attention to gold. And that's why this bull market is so strong. It's happening in, in complete obscurity. Um, and, and eventually, you know, people are going to notice this bull market, and that's going to be the next leg where people start believing in it, and, and it really starts to go, and the gold stocks really start to go. I mean, eventually, even the skeptics are going to come in, and that's going to be years and years from now. But first, we got to convince the gold bugs that they should come in <laughs> you know, even before we get to the skeptics. Even the gold companies. I was shocked recently when I heard Mark Bristow from uh, Barrick. He was asked the question, well, why don't you sit on gold? And he said, well, why would I put an ounce of gold? We're in the business of selling gold for, for money. And I don't know if he really did the extra, you know, put that forward, because basically what he's saying is it's better to hold fiat currency than that is constantly. Yeah, no, I mean, up. if you're if you're not going to pay it out as dividends, when you're a gold mining company, you're you're pulling money out of the ground. Right. The gold is the money. Right. You only sell the gold to pay the salaries of your workers, to pay the interest on your debt, to pay the dividends to your shareholders. But anything left over, gold companies would be better off just keeping the gold, uh, you know, on their balance sheet. I agree. You know? But you know, and and then they could you could use that gold, you know, because but any fiat the other- money they hold. I mean, that's like Michael Saylor's like, well, I don't want to keep dollars on my balance sheet. So I got Bitcoin. That makes no sense. (laughs) But keeping gold makes sense. But none of them are doing it. Out of all the companies I follow, there's only one that I know of, Silvercrest. That's a small miner relative to Barrick and Newmont and all these others. They are actually holding gold and silver on their balance sheet. About 30% of their war chest is in... Yeah, I mean, gold. all these gold companies have gold and silver as an asset on their balance sheet because it's in the mines. That's their, that's their reserves. So they have that. But it's just that once they pull it out of the ground and, and, and have it now in a form that it could be made into bullion, they, they then sell it. But they could hold it and sell it later and get a higher price. But, you know, but at least they're not, you know, hedging it like they used to. They used to just sell it all even before they got it out of the ground. Well, which gets me to my other point about Barrick. Barrick was one of the biggest culprits of holding back the gold price prior to 2001 because of their uh, hedging. Okay. And that legacy is still with them, whether they want to realize it or not. By them holding gold... I think they could start to heal that wound. Yeah, obviously, too, if the gold companies just mined gold and then held it, that would also push up the price of gold because there'd be less gold on the market. They're like, look, we're not selling this gold yet because we know if we just hold it, we can sell it in the future and get a lot more money for it. It's like they're selling something that's going to be a lot more valuable in the future. But the thing is, they've got a lot of reserves. So as long as they keep on mining, Every year, they're going to get more money for the gold they pull out of the ground. But they're putting it into fiat currencies that's getting constantly... Yeah, destroyed. there's no reason to do that. They should either pay it out to their shareholders uh, or, or, or hold it in bullion. I mean, don't sell the bullion if you don't need the money. And they don't. They have plenty of cash. They're sitting on mountains. 
the average price yeah. of producing an ounce of gold right now is about 1450 ish they're selling it for 2650 the the margins are insane why why do they need to build up fiat currency the whole argument against the whole argument for gold is against fiat currency why are these gold companies sitting on cash fiat yeah i mean <laughs> At this point, it, it doesn't make any sense. And maybe as gold is going up relentlessly day after day, week after week, month after month, uh, gold companies will realize it makes no sense to actually sell any more gold than they need to pay their bills. <laughs> and anything that's in excess. Now, of course, they could also raise their dividends if they got all this extra cash, just pay the shareholders, because that way I could take my dividend and I could buy more gold. But... You know, I, th that does them no good. Or they can pay me, they can pay me my dividends in gold. I'm happy to accept gold. <laughs> That's my what dividends. they really should be doing is pay, paying it. Because all the dividends and all the buybacks did nothing for them. But until February of this year, the gold stocks were in a bear market. All the buying of gold, their stock back, all the dividends did absolutely yeah. nothing. Although it they could buy back stock now. I mean, their stocks are underpriced. So that's another, that's better than holding cash is buying back their stock. For sure, for sure. Now, I think that the only reason gold has moved up is because some people are looking at the buyers, the, the buy side, and they're seeing that the BRICS nations, the Chinese, the Indians, even the West are getting into it <clears throat> by buying physical gold at Costco and Walmart. And, but it's all uh, built on the supply side, the demand. I don't think anybody understands how broken the supply chain is. Yeah, you know, and, and how little it has been invested in, re in exploration and development over the last couple of decades. We've had no major discoveries of new gold deposits. Um, yeah, I mean, th this this is going to be a, a bull market for the ages. I mean, you know, you got to, you know, even if you go back to the 1970s, I mean, this could even be bigger than that. And that's when gold went from $35 an ounce to 850. So do the do the math on that. Um, but I, I think we're staring at something much bigger. And again, remember, the gold bull market came to an end in 1980 because Volcker put interest rates at 20 percent to really you know, break the back of inflation and to reinstall confidence in the dollar and to and to get people to stop hoarding gold. Well, we're not even close to doing that. In fact, we're doing the opposite of that. And we're not even in a position where we could do that. Right. Uh, so I don't see that there's anything that could stop gold from going up because there's nothing that's going to stop the dollar from going down. And not just the dollar, the euro, the yen, the pound, all these Every fiat currencies fiat currency. are going to be losing value. And they are. Gold's up against every currency. Yes, in record fact, it was high. making new record highs in other currencies before it made a record high in the dollar. And now it's doing that. I don't, I, I cannot believe how people don't see what's going on with the supply chain. Right now, Economics 101 tells you the price is at a record. So what should the mining companies be doing? They should be increasing their production. Why can't they increase their production? Because they haven't invested, they've been high grading their mines. You know that's happening because you look at the the head grades, the average head grades have been in decline for over a decade. They've been high grading those mines, and now they've got the remnants left. So they can't increase their production. They can't replace their production because they haven't spent enough money on developers. The developer, there's not enough development projects because there hasn't been enough success with the exploration to find new, the supply. Right, well, are, and the capital hasn't been there to finance it. Nobody has wanted to loan money to these companies to ex do exploration. And for years and years, the cost of mining was rising even faster than the price of gold. So when gold went from 1,000 to 2,000, it didn't help a lot of companies because their costs went up so much. Because inflation was driving up the cost of mining a lot more than it was driving up the price of gold. That's now changing. Now gold is going to be moving up faster than the production costs. 
And so all that is dropping right to the bottom line of these gold mining companies. But I think the first thing that these major companies are going to do before they invest in exploration and development is they're going to just buy up smaller companies because that's a much uh, better return on investment where you know exactly what you're going to get for your money. You don't have to just gamble. You could just buy up another company and absorb those uh, resources. And now they have the money because a lot of these small mines don't even have the money to develop what they've got. And they weren't able to raise the money. But now if they get bought by a bigger company that has a huge war chest, then that company can afford to develop their resources. But there's nothing to buy. The cupboard is bare. There is not. These companies are so big now, Peter, that in order for them to move the needle, the amount, the menu of needle moving companies is bare. There's nothing there. That's why you look at the last couple of uh, takeovers, uh, Goldfield's taken over Osisco, and then uh, Anglo uh, taken over a company. They're being done at premiums because there is nothing for the majors to buy. Yeah, well, <laughs> there's, there's still something. But yeah, I agree that even if they buy up everything, it's not going to be enough. No. So they, the price of gold is going to have to go way, way up. Exactly. Exactly. On that note, you've been super kind with your time, Peter. I could talk to you for hours. I I love your drop the gloves nature because when I played hockey, I was an enforcer. It was my job. Oh, really? <laughs> look after our goalie and our best players. And I feel like I'm still doing that today when it comes to gold. But before I let you go, Peter, can you tell us a little bit about Aero Pacific Asset Management and what you do there uh, for people that are watching, my audience that can yeah. maybe use your services? Well, yeah, Euro Pacific Asset Management is a registered investment advisor. Uh, we're now based down here in Puerto Rico, which is where I've got my, my portfolio management team and some of the representatives are all working down here. And we manage individual portfolios. We focus on uh, global equities and bonds, as well as resources and, and, and precious metals mining. Uh, so you can contact us at europac.com is the website. Talk to one of our representatives about the strategies that we have to offer. I think it's very important that people you know, really divest of US dollar denominated assets and, and, and a, adopt a global portfolio. Uh, we look for value, we look for dividends, we look all around the world. We're not just buying ADRs in the US, we're buying ordinary shares on foreign exchanges. Uh, we're getting some very good returns this year. We're way ahead of our benchmarks for the last one, three and five years. So we've got a really good team of stock pickers. We don't index, uh, we look for the best stocks and avoid the worst ones and the returns uh, uh, bear that out. Uh, I think it's gonna get a lot better uh, in absolute returns once the dollar really starts to fall because that really causes these foreign assets to rise. You know, we've been operating in a stronger dollar environment. We're now transitioning into a weak dollar environment and that it means we'll have the wind at our backs instead of in our faces when it comes to uh, dollar, dollar returns. Uh, I, you know, we also manage uh, funds. We have five um, mutual funds that we manage from, um, you can, own the funds through your Pacific Asset Management, or you can go and buy them um, at a um, discount broker. All of my funds have a no load share class. In fact, we're talking about gold mining stocks. The symbol on my gold fund is EPGIX. That's Euro Pacific uh, GIX. It's a no load share class of my gold fund. Adrian Day manages that fund for me. He's done an excellent job for 30 or 40 years managing gold portfolios. I think we've got a fantastic portfolio, uh, some really good junior miners in there mixed in with the royalty companies and some of the majors. So, you know, you don't have to do it yourself, you know, just buy my fund and let Adrian do the work. Uh, I think it's more than worth uh, the fee. Can they also pay. buy physical gold funds from you? Yeah, or? if you, well, it, I, I, everybody should have some physical gold and silver in their possession. Just don't tell me where you keep it, but you should have it. Uh, and you should contact Shift Gold. That's my gold company, shiftgold.com. Um, and, um, you know, you can so order it. You, we ac you actually can go on the website and just fill up a shopping cart and check out now. That's a new thing this year. 
We used to, you used to have to just talk to a representative. We still offer that services for people who prefer the human touch and to you know, have somebody to bounce ideas off and make recommendations. But if you know what you want, you could just buy it, check out. You're gonna get a great price uh, at, at, at Shift Gold. Also, make sure to follow me. Uh, I have a free newsletter, a really good one that we put out several times a week over at shiftsovereign.com. Just go there, Shift Sovereign, give us your email information. I signed up. I signed up. Great, great. And follow me on social media, my podcast, at least one a week, sometimes two or three uh, at uh, Shift Radio, uh, my YouTube channel, because I do it live with you know video at the Shift Report. That's my YouTube channel. Uh, follow me on X. I've got over a million followers there. I'm, I'm posting everyday ideas, comments. So make sure to follow me and encourage your friends to do that. But I'm also, you know, you get me on Facebook, you know, uh, on uh, Instagram, uh, uh, TikTok. You know, there's content that we're putting out uh, that you should, you know, make a make a habit of uh, of keeping keeping up with. Well, I started out by saying the gold industry should send you a thank you note because you have long term been one of the most vocal. You guys who drops his gloves and doesn't mind fighting <laughs> with the Wall Street types or the CNBC types or the or the Bitcoin people. Uh, yeah. But what you were describing there for Euro Pacific, it really struck me, Peter, that you know, for what we see coming ahead, you're you're offering products that can help people because okay, I'm a big I'm a big gold guy. I love gold stocks. I know them inside out. I've been doing this for 30 years. But for other investors, they, they should have gold in their portfolio. But if they're going to own stocks, they shouldn't be buying these high multiple, uh, insane valuation stocks that are built on nothing but hot air. They should be more defensive finding value and companies that are are increasing their 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 valuation their value through making money because mm -hmm. people need what they are going to consume what they make no matter what the economic situation is yeah exactly exactly okay thanks a lot <laughs> peter i'm going to close it okay. off thanks everybody for joining us do your homework speak with your financial advisors um, you know, do all you do all that sort of stuff and have a great day. We'll talk to you soon.